Um, hi, my name is Megan Roberts. I'm a genetic counselor who today is going to talk to you about hereditary gastric cancer. Uh, it's important to start by disclosing that I am an employee of GeneDX, which is a commercial laboratory offering genetic testing. So we're gonna jump into our agenda. I'm gonna go over the topics for discussion today so you have a brief idea of what we're going to discuss together. And then we'll get into um, sub subsequent slides which cover our agenda items. So the first is an overview of inherited predispositions to gastric cancer, uh, followed by an overview of CDH1 particularly, as I think um, a lot of people know causes hereditary diffuse gastric and lobular breast cancer. Then we'll discuss genetic counseling and testing considerations for hereditary gastric uh, cancer. And then we'll wrap the presentation up by focusing on updates to CDH1 penetrance estimates based on multi-gene panel testing. So first and foremost, I wanna start by just talking a little bit of ga about gastric cancer statistics. Um, nearly 1 million people per year are impacted by gastric cancer. The majority of cases are sporadic and thought to be due to H. pylori with about 10% uh, being noted as familial. Now, of all the gastric cancers observed, uh, it's thought that about 1% to 3% of cases are due to a known hereditary gastric cancer syndrome. There are two major histological classifications, and that is intestinal diffuse, with intestinal being more common than diffuse. And then the general population lifetime risk of gastric cancer is estimated to be around 0.8%. So, We'll jump into an overview of inherited predispositions to gastric cancer. Here you see I have CDH1 um, kind of grayed out because we're going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about CDH1 and hereditary diffuse gastric and lobular uh, breast cancer. So at this point I want to focus on some of these other syndromes. Uh, Lynch syndrome, which is due to pathogenic variants in the mismatch repair genes, uh, more commonly known as MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2, as well as five uh, prime uh, deletions in, in EPCAM, have been associated with gastric cancer with lifetime risk estimated to be less than 1% to 9%. Uh, they are most commonly reported in association with intestinal histology. Um, TP53 pathogenic variants, which cause bleed for Mimi syndrome, have been associated with about a 1 to 4% lifetime risk of gastric cancer and have been reported to um, predispose to both diffuse and intestinal histology. Now, we need to talk about the APC gene in kind of two different realms, the first being FAP or familial autonomous polyposis. Um, fundic gland polyps are uh, common in this syndrome and thought to have little to no malignant potential. It's actually the more rare gastric adenomas arising in the antrum that are the concern. However, the malignant potential of these gastric adenomas appear to be low with a lifetime risk of gastric cancer estimated to be less than 1% for Western populations. Now, GAPS or gastric adenocarcinoma and proximal polyposis of the stomach is a more recently described syndrome. Um, it's a phenotypic variant of familial adenomatous polyposis resulting from pathogenic missense variants located in promoter 1B of the APC gene and appears to have a higher risk for gastric cancer um, than those with classic or attenuated uh, familial adenomatous polyposis. However, the lifetime risk associated with pathogenic APC promoter 1B variants is currently not well defined. Okay, so unlike the previous syndromes that I just mentioned, um, STK11 causes Pujegger syndrome, and this is a hamartomatous polyposis syndrome. Particularly, uh, individuals with Pujegger syndrome will develop hamartomatous polyps throughout the GI tract. And it's been estimated that individuals with Pujegger syndrome have up to a 29% lifetime risk to develop gastric cancer. Uh, BMPR1A and SMAD4 are two genes that cause juvenile polyposis. And like Pujegger's, it is a, another hamartomatous polyposis syndrome. And it's estimated to come with a lifetime risk of gastric cancer of up to 21%. While SMAD4 and BMPR1A are commonly lumped together in the literature when it comes to gastric cancer risk, uh, it is well known that individuals with SMAD4 pathogenic variants are more likely to have a heavy gastric polyp burden uh, in the stomach. So 
it is fair to kind of assume, I think, that SMAD4 pathogenic variant carriers may have a higher risk than those with um, BMPR1A pathogenic variants. Uh, now, CTNNA1 is particularly of interest. This is a newer gene which has been identified to have an association with hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. Um, this more recent association has been highlighted by uh, a paper published be between, um, by PIN in collaboration with Invitae, which has provided some convincing evidence that CTNNA uh, loss of function variants are associated with an increased risk of diffuse gastric cancer particularly. So they present uh, similarly to what you would expect for CDH1. Uh, in this paper, they do note that there's reduced penetrance, and what that means is essentially that there's not a 100% chance that an individual with a pathogenic variant in this gene will develop cancer. Um, they could carry it and not develop it. Uh, but the lifetime risk of gastric cancer associated with CTN and A1 pathogenic variants at this time is uh, unknown. So, we have this other category, which I'm gonna call possible. And when I say possible, I mean, there's literature which suggests a possible association, right, uh, with gastric cancer. However, it's not a well-established association at this point. Um, I'm gonna discuss three genes, which are kind of commonly assessed or, or mentioned as being associated with gastric cancer outside of the ones we've already discussed, but this definitely doesn't mean that uh, there aren't others which haven't been published in association. So. Uh, the first one is, are, is BRCA1 and 2. These are two genes which are most commonly associated with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. There was a paper uh, mo more recently published by Lee et al., which was a large meta-analysis, which actually concluded no risk, increased risk of uh, gastric cancer for BRCA1, but did find a relative risk of about 2 for BRCA2. ATM is another gene which is known for hereditary risk for breast cancer. Uh, Hall et al. 2021 uh, uh, looked at 4,607 ATM pathogenic variant carriers that were identified via multi-gene panel testing and found that 12 or 0.3% had gastric cancer. This actually ended up um, coming to the, they came, came to the conclusion that there was about an odds ratio of three when it came to an association for gastric cancer with ATM. And then POW-B2, is also another gene which has been associated with, or is known to uh, be associated with hereditary breast cancer. And while there are publications which do suggest the association, there has been an overall conclusion at this point that the statistical evidence is still kind of weak and a um, uh, number or quantification of risk cannot be um, calculated at this time. Okay, so I wanna move on to an overview of CDH1 with respect to hereditary diffuse gastric and hereditary lobular breast cancer. Now, CDH1 is a gene that codes for ECADHERIN, um, which is a cell to cell adhesion glycoprotein that acts as a critical invasion suppressor. So, cell to cell adhesion is primarily achieved via homophilic binding, forming adherin junctions. Uh, CDH1 was first implicated in hereditary gastric cancer in 1998 by Perry Guilford et al. and has since emerged as the primary cause of hereditary gastric cancer and lobular breast cancer, uh, which are autosomal dominant disorders. For cancer to develop, somatic inactivation or downregulation of the wild type allele must occur, and promoter hypermethylation is the most commonly observed mechanism leading to biallelic inactivation. So while we will be focused on hereditary diffuse gastric and lobular breast cancer today, I do like to briefly point out that there are other phenotypes associated with this gene. Um, CDH1 plays a vital role in oral facial development during embryogenesis. Thus, it's not uh, surprising, but important to note that cleft lip and palate are part of the hereditary diffuse gastric and lobular breast cancer syndromes. Okay. So genetic counseling and testing considerations for hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. Here you see um, the International Gastric Cancer Linkage Consortium's 2020 hereditary diffuse gastric cancer genetic testing criteria. Um, 
the first thing I notice when I look at these criteria is that the majority of them are very gastric centric. So in general, they're requiring two or more gastric um, or breast cancers, but two or more cancers per family with at least one being confirmed as diffuse gastric or a lobular breast cancer. Uh, the limitations of this criteria seem to be the lack of ability of family members to obtain histology for those that are affected with gastric or breast cancer. And a lot of this criteria, again, does require that at least one be confirmed as diffuse gastric or breast cancer. So sometimes meeting this criteria can be difficult for those unaffected individuals who have a family history, but yet we don't have histology. So a PATH report, which says, yes, this is definitely diffuse type gastric cancer, or this is lobular type breast cancer. Um, one thing that the International Gastric Cancer League Consortium did add to this most recent update of diffused gastric cancer uh, genetic testing criteria is the fact that uh, CTNNA should be included when CDH1 is negative. Um, otherwise, the, the criteria itself is pretty straightforward and should be used as a guideline uh, when deciding if somebody should undergo genetic testing for hereditary diffuse gastric or lobular breast cancer. When the concern is regarding, say, uh, CDH1, the possibility of a CDH1 pathogenic variant. I do think it's kind of important to highlight that Learner and All 2020 um, expressed some concerns over the how stringent the IGCLC 2020 criteria are. This is actually a recent publication, and I'm talking recent just in the last few weeks, which is a publication in collaboration with Ambry Genetics and Yale, uh, where they looked at 112 families with CDH1 pathogenic variants identified via multi-gene panel testing. And what they ended up finding is the criteria that I had just shown you, which were established by the IGCLC, had a sensitivity of about 18.8%. Now, because of this low sensitivity, they did try to develop um, some new criteria which would potentially have better sensitivity, which they're calling the Yale criteria, which are actually a combination of NCCN or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer criteria, in combination with some criteria that they actually wrote or developed, which they refer to as significant diffuse gastric cancer history. Um, and what that is defined as uh, what I have outlined here, which is one patient with diffuse gastric cancer at any age or a patient with family members who, where there are two or more cases of gastric cancer and first or secondary relatives when at least one is confirmed to be diffused or diagnosed at age 50 or younger. Now they looked at these two criteria separately and they found a 70.5% sensitivity and a 31.3% sensitivity. However, when you combine the two together, they got a sensitivity of 86.6%. So their conclusions were that while IGCLC has tried very, very hard to create some uh, guidelines for who should be tested for, say, CDH1, it still is fairly restrictive. And one of the biggest restrictions is the requirement of histology be, um, being confirmed, so either the confirmation of diffuse gastric or the confirmation of lobular breast cancer. Uh, while the Yale criteria using both the NCCN hereditary breast and ovarian cancer plus their newly defined significant diffused gastric cancer history is a more well-rounded way to catch more individuals with pathogenic variants in the CDH1 gene. Okay, so we've discussed a little bit about some guidelines that are available to help determine if an individual should be tested for the presence of a CDH1 pathogenic variant. And now I wanna kind of move on to what are some of these genetic testing considerations? So we've decided somebody should be tested, but what are some additional considerations when it comes to actually doing the genetic testing? And I would say one of the first things is to make sure that if you're gonna be doing genetic testing, which is going to be used for medical management, that testing should always be done at a CLIA approved laboratory. 
Second, it needs to be decide what type of testing is done. So, you know, deciding whether somebody's going to have, say, CDH1 genetic testing plus CT and an A1 alone, or a multi gene panel, which is a much larger set of uh, a much larger gene list an individual would be tested for, is going to be made based at the patient level, the patient's level of uh, comfort with the testing and also the providers. I will say that the genetics community in general is moving more towards multi gene panel testing than single gene, as you do find kind of one off explanations for, say, reported family history. It's particularly helpful when you don't have. Uh, confirmation of pathology, and so you don't really know if you're de actually dealing with, say, lobular breast cancer or ductal um, within a family, or if you're dealing with just, say, diffuse gastric cancer versus intestinal um, uh, gastric cancer. We also need to consider the age of testing. So an individual who is personally affected, that person should always be tested regardless of their age. Um, at least I'm going to say when it comes to um, gastric and breast cancer. But when you're talking about unaffected individuals, so an individual comes to see um, a genetics provider who's unaffected based just on family history, we need to consider the age at which that individual undergoes testing. Uh, the, in, the general consensus by the IGCLC is that individuals who are unaffected um, can be tested at 18 years or older unless the family history indicates that they should be tested younger. And then the other real consideration is who should be tested. So within the family, it's preferred that an affected family member be tested. We do know this isn't always possible as the affected family member uh, may unfortunately no longer be with us. And then we well, should have definitely have discussions about testing unaffected family members, but when somebody is available and affected, um, there should be a discussion about testing that individual first. And I will get into that just a little bit more here in a few slides. So I wanted to highlight, I know I previously had just kind of briefly mentioned that CDH1 is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. Um, what that means is that first year relatives have a 50% chance to test positive when there's a known pathogenic CDH1 variant in the gene. And then second year relatives have a 25% chance. The um, picture over here depicts kind of why that is. So in this picture, it's the male or the father who has a pathogenic CDH1 variant, which is indicated by the purple. And then the light blue is indicating a normal copy of that gene. Everyone has two copies of these genes, one they inherit from the mother and one they inherit from their father. So for this affected male who has one copy of a CDH1 gene with a pathogenic variant present, each one of his children are going to have a one out of two chance or a 50% chance that his children will actually inherit that um, copy of the gene with the pathogenic variant. Now the other copy they'll get from their mother, who in this case has two normal working copies of that gene. So the risk is coming from the father and for each child independently. This picture does show you all four possibilities per pregnancy, um, but each pregnancy will have a one out of two chance or a 50% chance to inherit the uh, pathogenic variant or the, the allele, so the CDH1 gene with the pathogenic variant. Okay, so let's revisit the idea of who's best to test and what implications that has on the family. Um, this is, I'm gonna kind of throw this out there that this is not a family of, a CDH1 family of mine. This is a family I pulled from the literature. It is um, published in Chen et al, 2011. And you see here that the proband, so when I say proband, a proband is the individual within the family who is coming for the genetic consultation. So in this case, it's a 46 year old male. Now males are squares and females are circles. If somebody has a, a line through them, that's indicated that they have passed away and individuals who don't have lines through them should be living. So our proband is a 46 year old male with no personal history of gastric cancer, but he's reported that he has several family members. So a first degree relative, a sister, first degree relative, a father, and then some second degree relatives, a, a paternal uncle and a paternal grandfather, as well as another paternal aunt, all with diffuse gastric cancer. Now in this case, 
the best person to test in this family is your proband's niece. And that is because this is the only living relative in the family who has a um, diagnosis of diffuse gastric cancer. She's the best person to test simply because she has a higher a priori risk to test positive. So we're more likely to find a pathogenic variant in CDH1 in this individual in the family than we will unaffected family members. And that is important when you start talking about how you interpret negative test results for unaffected family members, okay? So if our um, cousin, or I'm sorry, our niece here does test positive, then we know exactly what's going on in the family. We can put a name to it and we can test our proband to say, yes, they have it or no, they don't. If they uh, don't have it, and again, this person's positive, then we could say you don't have what's going on in the family and this is an informative negative. However, if this individual who has the history of the diffuse gastric cancer does not test, and I test only my unaffected proband and that proband's negative, I don't know if my proband is negative because we, that we aren't able to identify what's going on in the family or if um, there is something, but they don't have it. So that has to be interpreted differently than if you do know that there's a pathogenic variant within the family and your individual, the individual test negative. The other benefit um, is when it comes to familial testing, if you identify what's going on within the family, you can offer that familial testing to other at-risk family members. And then again, the interpretation of a negative is much easier in the presence of a known positive. Okay, so at this point, we've talked about who should undergo testing. And now we're gonna talk about um, the possible different results you can get once genetic testing is, is, uh, is ordered and completed. Um, so we're gonna start by talking about possible test results, meaning there is actually something found, okay? So the first possible result is a pathogenic variant. Um, a pathogenic variant means, yes, we found a change within the CDH1 gene, and we know it gives an increased risk for diffuse gastric and lobular breast cancer. The second is a likely pathogenic variant. Likely pathogenic variants are highly suspicious to be causative, and they come with a 90% likelihood of being pathogenic. Um, these types of, of variants, so those that are pathogenic and likely pathogenic, are considered medically actionable, and we do recommend familial testing for these so that we can determine if at-risk family members have inherited the risk or not. Now, moving down a little further, we have variants of uncertain significance. Okay, this truly means we found a change within the sequence of the CDH1 gene, but we don't know if it actually causes a risk or if it's just a benign finding within the family. Uh, after variant of uncertain significance, you can also get a likely benign or a benign variant. Um, likely benign and benign variants often aren't even reported because the association with a possible increased risk of cancer um, has been uh, generally ruled out. Um, but variants of uncertain significance, likely benign variants, and benign variants are considered not medically actionable, okay? So uh, we screen these families that are found to have these types of variants based on personal and family history, and we don't recommend familial testing for them. So, of course, the other possible result is a negative, and we have briefly touched on there's two ways to interpret a negative, and that's informative. Um, a negative and uninformative negatives. And this is really getting um, more into, you know, an informative negative is really when there's a identified CDH1 pathogenic variant within the family, but additional family members have tested negative. So we know what's going on and they do not have it. And then an uninformative negative can actually be, you have an affected individual that tested negative and we still haven't explained the family history or we have tested an unaffected individual within the family and we have not had the chance to, affect it in, to test an affected individual, so we don't know if we've been able to identify what's going on or not. Um, some other considerations to consider around genetic testing is 
once a pathogenic or a likely pathogenic variant is identified, um, if the individual who has one of the has a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in CDH1 is of reproductive age, we generally do recommend that there be some discussion about the option of, say, pre-implantation genetic testing or reproductive uh, screening uh, when it comes to um, the risk uh, for future generations. Okay, so I want to spend the last part of our time together discussing CDH1 penetrance estimates based on multi-gene panel testing. So in the summer of 2019, two independent uh, publications came out evaluating CDH1 penetrance based on families that were not selected for based on strict clinical criteria. Um, the first was Excola et al., and that was a collaboration between Yale and Ambry Genetics. And then the second was a paper that I led, uh, which was a collaboration between GeneDx and the University of Washington. Okay, so I wanted to briefly discuss what previous penetrance estimates are. And again, when I say the word penetrance, penetrance means what's the chance that an individual with a pathogenic variant and CDH1 will develop diffuse gastric cancer or breast cancer, okay, or lobular breast cancer. And previous penetrance estimates um, have been as high as, you know, 80% is kind of what most people say. You can see though, we need to talk about ascertainment. So how are the families that were studied in these studies, how are they ascertained to these studies? And the most significant thing or the commonality amongst all three of the papers that are highly cited in previous publications is that these individuals were ascertained based on strict clinical criteria. So either older IGCLC based criteria or they had um, some type of cutoff. So like at least three diffused gastric cancers in the family. And so I think the take home message here is that all of these families that were included in these papers had multiple gastric cancers because they were ascertained based on that phenotype. So the presentation of gastric cancer within those families. And as a result, we ended up with lifetime risks that had been quoted for men, say up to 70% and up to 83% for women. Now, um, in both studies recently completed here in 2019, the penetrance estimates were made, use, made using um, only families with complete pedigrees and that were not ascertained highly based on, say, some pre-established clinical criteria. Uh, the lifetime risk of gastric cancer by the age of 80 was found to be 37 to 42% for men and 25 to 33% for women. Well, the lifetime risk of breast cancer was found to be 43 to 55%. So in our GeneDx cohort, we also assessed the lifetime risk of colorectal cancer as there's been speculation of an increased risk and found risk consistent with those within the general population. So importantly, even though both cohorts um, did not ascertain based on strict criteria, these individuals were referred to laboratories for genetic testing uh, based on some suspicion, right, by their ordering provider. So there still likely represents some type of ascertainment. And so this is still a higher risk population than say, looking for uh, CDH1 pathogenic variants within the general population. So in all reality, these penetrance estimates could possibly still be slight overestimates just based on how the individuals were ascertained. So a quick summary when it comes to CDH1 penetrance estimates. So historically, estimates have been based, based on cohorts which have been ascertained based on strict clinical testing criteria, which has been very gastric cancer centric. Um, updated penetrance estimates are based on families undergoing multi-gene panel testing and not ascertained based on strict clinical um, criteria. However, they're not completely free of ascertainment bias as those individuals undergoing testing had some clinical indication for which their order provider thought hereditary cancer multi-gene panel testing was indicated. 
And finally, while updated penetrance estimates for gastric cancer differ from the historical ones, the breast cancer estimates are fairly similar, okay? Um, you can see here, breast cancer historical lifetime risk were kind of 39 to 52%, while the uh, updated estimates are 43 to 55%. So there's really not much of a, as a, a difference. You don't as that observed in the gastric cancer estimates. And we really think that's because all of these families historically were based again on gastric cancer centric um, criteria, and they really didn't focus on breast cancer as an inclusion or an exclusion. Um, so without, so I guess the, the take home to this, I apologize, is that the gastric cancer penetrance estimates are lower than we previously thought with men having more of a 37 to 42% lifetime risk and women having more of a 25 to 33% risk. Um, it is important to note that, you know, amongst different families, these risks will vary. You'll see some families that are much more, um, at risk just based on family history with multiple cases of gastric cancer. And then you're also gonna see some families which may not even have gastric cancer in the family. Those are really the hardest families to know how to counsel and how to um, proceed with making any type of medical management recommendations. Okay, thank you.